Happy Earth Day, everyone. And welcome to this celebration. It is a celebration in many ways, a celebration of the two communities, both the artistic and cultural and the human communities. And it's just such a pleasure for us, one, to work with these artists' work and to know them as people and start to forge friendships and relationships and it feels like collaborations and borders being crossed, and that's just fantastic. I, I'm not a fan of borders. Um, we hope this discussion, the plan is for it to be very informal. We're gonna to introduce topics. Our experts and wonderful people will reply. Uh, the hope is that they give an insight into themselves for you, how it is to be an artist, how it is to be an artist in this area of North America and in the world, how the environment affects them, all kinds of things. And we just hope you get to know them and, and enjoy this. Okay, I'd just like to introduce um, Patrick, obviously. Um, John McDonald. Uh, actually, with John, I'd wait until you hear him talk, until you applaud. Uh, Danielle Dean. Glenn Hendrick. <laughs> Sam Montebetti. <laughs> who, who is wonderfully framed, I think, in, with the image behind him. <laughs> and Joe Miller. <laughs> and Anna Gustafson. <laughs> okay, we're gonna get going and um, I'm gonna start you off with a question which I'm gonna need my glasses for. I can do it, thank you. Okay, so um, the Salish Sea and living here and working here. Um, I know some of you have lived in other environments as well as here and in your work you can see inspirations from other landscapes other areas, other ways that societies work. Um, I'd like you, if you can, if you want to, to tell us a little bit about how those environments have affected your work, your development as an artist, um, and then what is special and unique about living here in, in the Salish Sea, in the Pacific Northwest? Why are you living here as opposed to in that previous landscape environment? Um, Joe, why don't you kick us off? Because um, I know you've, or well, you've been up in the Pacific North Northwest for forty years or so. Is, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's live. But but um, but you have been in other places in in the U.S. and been very influenced by those landscapes. Do you want to just talk us a little bit about that, please? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I started my first painting in uh, <clears throat> Indiana in uh, 1959. I remember signing the painting. It was my very first signed painting. And uh, then I had the pleasure of moving to Moab, Utah, which uh, I spent a great deal of time at being the desert. It was wonderful, the, the blue and the red are, uh, I've never lost that feeling for a red arch with a blue sky coming through it and that relationship is just so exciting to me and I still carry that with me always. And then uh, halfway through that, this career, I met a woman named Dana and she needed somebody to make stretchers for her so I, was, spent my life enjoying making stretches for her and she paints all the time as uh, we both do and except I make stretchers quite a bit of my time <laughs> and, uh, uh, we've just had this wonderful life on San Juan Island I took her to Moab and I said you, you can love it here and she spent just a little while it's kind of different culture it's a uh, another group of people called Mormons, and they're 
Uh, we grew up with them in Salt Lake City. And, uh, it was tough being a non-Mormon, living in a Mormon culture, but a wonderful culture, uh, a very artistic. Uh, the, the Mormon culture really doesn't accept anything except landscape, very realistic, beautiful landscape paintings uh, of the mountains, mostly of northern Utah. Uh, we, we preferred the mountains for skiing, and, but uh, they preferred them for painting them in, in situ or, or, you know, being in place and painting what you were seeing and interpreting that onto canvas. So that's first also how I sort of learned to paint. First thing I did as a young artist was paint a mountain. <laughs> and I still pre really love mountains, that mountain form and clouds passing over the mountain. But uh, then coming here, I really get a lot of clouds to work with. So I'm glad I've come, come here and half my life has been spent now on San Juan Island. And I just love the islands and coming here to this island and seeing the atmospheres yesterday was very vivid and the beaches, oh, and the shale shapes. Uh, it's a subject that you just look at the ground on the beaches and it's, what more do you need? Thanks. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Joe. That was a little long. I went. <clears throat> no, 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 that was, that was lovely. That was lovely. Um, Sam, uh, how about you with, with growing up here? I know that has influenced your work and now studying in Montreal, um, that's a very different environment. How does that feel for you? Yeah, can people hear me okay? I think so, yeah. I, I, I feel pretty similar to Joe in that growing up here and spending, you know, growing up on Salt Spring, you naturally spend so much time outside and uh, just walking around and spending a lot of time at the beaches, at the lakes, and at the bodies of water. They kind of always, I, I like how you said it, kind of stay with me and I kind of carry these uh, landscapes with me no matter where I go. And artistically, that was kind of the beginning because that's where I would go to listen to music a lot of the time. It's very calming to do outside and especially in like, coincidentally, the Salish Sea. I grew up um, on Fernwood Road, so I would go down to the beach there with the pier quite a bit. I still do whenever I'm back. Um, so I, I associate a lot of the kind of base levels, I think, of what makes me an artist, some of those early times where uh, listening to music and, and realizing the profound effect uh, something can have on me were at the ocean. And compared to somewhere like Montreal, one of the things I notice a lot these days is how beautiful the natural light is because there's no street lights and so you know especially come twilight time or something like that it's so bright here still it's really i mean it happens every day but it's still so it's so beautiful it's like walking i think of it like walking in a painting because it's such a it's just a really special way the light lingers at that time of year or sorry that time of day when the sun has gone down um yeah, is that enough? I don't yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything's enough and or, or not enough. It doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> um, anything you want to add yet? Or? Uh, I got lots of other questions, but no. Oh, well, we'll keep, keep going on this. So, Glenn, um, your prints, which unfortunately have had to be sort of put away sold. so we could get everybody. Oh, sold. You bought them? They're just, they just um, all sold. <laughs> just, just, just like that, gone. overnight. Um, but they will return this afternoon. Um, but f the sense I get from them, they're, they're very def definitely landscapes, but they are abstracted and I would say almost dreamscapes as well, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, is that accurate? Is it based on your environment and then you play? How does that work for you? Yeah, exactly. It is based on my environment, and then I play. That is perfect. Um, well, I spent most of my formative years in the Midwest in really flat parts of the country. Um, I went to school in Chicago. I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. It's just really, really, really flat out there. Um, and the first time 
I ever came out, well, when I moved out to the island sight unseen, uh, to this magical landscape, I was just, it's just so different here. It's just the hills, like we just don't even have hills where I'm from. It's like to get any perspective at all, you have to go up onto an overpass over a freeway or go into a tall building. It's just really, really different. It's like flat. So it's really easy to ride your bike, but <laughs> there's, really, there's really not a lot of you know, perspective. So coming out here, it was just mind blowing, just so mind blowing. I remember just wandering around in this haze of extra oxygenation and just <laughs> driving around and just seeing like, just like the clouds, like Joe was saying, just like coming. It just like, it seemed like to me, it was like all the islands were like these sleeping dragons and they were just like breathing clouds. And it was like their breath and it was, I was like, this is where the clouds were born. <laughs> and this is where this is where they come up and then this is like where they go out over the rest of the country. And yeah, I just fell in love and um I feel like my work in this show particularly is just kind of a reflection of just that kind of magical it's like the islands are alive to me when I see them. Um, especially, you know, sailing through the islands on the ferries and all the time we have to spend doing that, which is actually pretty cool if you think about it. Um, and just, yeah, I love just seeing them kind of moving back and forth in front of each other and just the endless variation of the colors and the light just changing so much. In Chicago, it's you know, a weather system moves in and it just sits. <laughs> It'll be raining for like you know, two weeks and like the sky will just be like kind of light gray and you know, we get these big thunderstorms and things like that, but here it's just like every hour it seems like it's changing and moving through and the colors and it's just, it's mesmerizing. So yeah, thank you. Okay, lovely, thank you. Um, Anna, um, uh, I don't know, can you, do you wanna just tell us a little bit about, I know um, you have, European origins and no, uh, you spent time in New York, you have spent time in many different places, but can you tell us about how this area, this island in particular if you wish, but the Salish Sea, how that has mm, driven your work, if it has, because I think your work comes from many different places and it's not just here, but do you want to talk a bit? Okay, my brain is just kind of following your question up and down. And oh, so, well, yeah, that's the landscape. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't live in the world of a, a landscape artist, but I live in this world. And so I think when I was been listening and, and all of the the imagery that's being raised of the clouds and the movement and the mountains, it actu it's really where I live, but I think my work is sort of more in my head. So, but I have to say that every time I drive down, and I don't even know the name of all the roads here, so that's kind of crazy. <laughs> I think it's Lower Ganges Road, and I come down the hill, and I see the harbor. I've been here over 20 years, but every time I drive down, and it doesn't matter what the weather is, I just think, I can't believe I live here. Mm -hmm. And it's just like my heart is so full and open, and I am so grateful. I can go to kind of into my head and a little bit dark places and do this intense work that is really repetitive here. I couldn't do this work if I was living in a highly stimulated grid. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate living here and I, I revere it, mm. even though I'm not painting it. Mm. I think that's a really good point. I think I think the um, landscape we live in really allows us to do other things, to to breathe and to create. So I think that's great. And John, I'm I'm gonna bring you in now because I think you might be fairly similar to that in some ways. I do know I'm your you grew up in Prince George, 
um, which isn't a crime. But I, <laughs> you don't know what I did there. <laughs> oh, I probably, maybe it was then. <laughs> but um, and you, you <laughs> oh, <don't get> <laughs> It wasn't that funny. <laughs> Oops. Um, yeah, yeah, so I, th I think your work is informed from many different places and internally as well. Um, but does living here on Salt Spring and in this region, does that give you freedom or does it help you? How does it affect you? I don't know right now, uh, you know, with COVID and uh, not having been out for probably three years, you know, you ever have those experiences when you're having an out of body experience and you're going, how the hell did I get here? Why am I sitting in this chair? And who are all you people? I don't know. So it's, <laughs> it's very strong. It'll hopefully pass, uh, pass along a little bit. But, uh, um, I, I think um, uh, I'm someone who can be influenced by um, really anything, and I, allow, I try to allow myself to be really open to that. Um, I can be influenced by a color or a form, or if I'm watching a television show, I can be influenced by something, and um, I, um, I'm not that good at editing things, so um, I try not to. I try to uh, take all the different things that I'm working on and have it in my work, and I bury it in my work. Uh, the work over at Demand and Hall right now has a lot of different layers in it. Um, I, I have all this sort of layered stuff going on, and uh, I think uh, my whole experience, as uh, the artist Joan Mitchell said, she said she carries, she's an abstract painter, but she carries the landscape, uh, uh, as Sam said, kind of inside yourself. You, you carry things inside yourself, I tend to live quite a bit inside my own head. Um, I always have. And uh, I've learned to live with that and, uh, and uh, appreciate it, actually. Um, it's created a, a richness and texture that, uh, um, that I've tried to evolve and, and develop. And uh, I don't think I answered your question, but that's about it. So. Mm. No, no, it's, it's good. It's good. Um, Danielle. Um, slightly different because you actually immerse yourself in the Salish Sea to create some of your work, and um, which is different. So, do you want to just talk about that? How does it feel when you actually go underwater and you capture images, and, and uh, the same way people are perhaps talking about mountains and clouds? Do you get the similar feeling under the water? Definitely, and. Um so I, I've been, since I've moved out here, I've been ob obsessing over the horizon and this concept of above and below. And I feel like like all us humans, we reside on this, in this middle, middle ground and there's all the chaos that's there. But if you go up into the sky or down into the sea, it's, the language is the same, and it's, um, to me, it's, it's spiritual. I'm not, I'm not religious, but I'm, spiritual you can look at um, microcosms and macrocosms and um, so to me when I go underwater if anybody's been swimming out here it, it is kind of like flying through outer space um, there's particulates the light comes through in, in a different way and and I get fully immersed in a wetsuit and of course it's the the seas freezing out here so um, I'm very comfortable in my wetsuit once I get into it it's a challenge getting in and out of it unfortunately but um, but yeah once I'm under there then it is this this shift of of perspective that's often mm. that's similar to staring up at the night sky um, so I, I do a, a lot of thinking about above and below and um, so I do a lot of sky gazing and swimming. Okay, great. Um, let's move on. To choose to live your career as an artist is not an easy one. And there's an old model that existed you know, in, in the last century where an artist moves usually to an urban center, uh, Toronto, Vancouver, Chicago, New York, uh, in order to get access to the galleries, to the collectors, to the scene. 
Um, it's a lot about networking. It's a lot about being seen by the right people at the right time, because as we all know, the, the career path of an artist can be quite, quite varied. Um, it's a challenge, a unique challenge, living where you live to be seen, um, to maybe perhaps gather the type of attention or the type of recognition you might be looking for. Do you find any conflict um, by living in the Salish Sea here as opposed to an urban center where you may have more attention, more connection to the larger galleries and collectors? You want to start us off, Anna? <laughs> So that's a huge topic. Um, so I did live in Vancouver when at the start of my career, and um, I am not very good at reaching out in the best of times. Um, and also, I am really bad at staying in any particular anything. So whether it's a medium or a subject or so when I <clears throat> when I was actually in conversation with galleries, um, the main problem was that I wouldn't sit still. I wouldn't stay with one medium or one subject and I was a very frustrating person. So I just decided that my career would be not, I think. I, although I am always desperate to show my work, I, I couldn't get entangled with the conflict with, between myself and how the art world works. So I just made what I needed to make, and that's what I continue to do, and I've had day jobs, and mm -hmm. For a while, I panicked and became a clothing designer, believe it or not, but anyway. Um, so I did that, and I then I did ceramic product so that I could help raise and educate our two kids. And then, um, yeah, we homesteaded, we built our place, we cleared. So it's really not the way to build an artistic career, but man, I've had a great life. <laughs> and I am happy with the work that I'm doing, and um, I have a B&B, &B and that keeps things. I don't have to do project anymore. And I have um, been lucky in the last little while of um, getting grants, and I, for a while, had a patron. So, I mean, how great is that? Mm -hmm. And look at who I'm sitting with, <laughs> and I'm showing. So, yeah, I can't. I cannot give any career advice. <laughs> Joe, you've spent time working um, in other parts of the country before you moved to the Salish Sea. Do you think living where you've lived for as long as you have, do you think it's impacted your career, and if so, in a positive way, or perhaps a negative way? I, I really don't have a career. <laughs> I just have every day I paint or I make stretchers for my wife who paints <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I live in this amazing place and I have a brother who lives in Manhattan, the city of and on. Uh, so I've got riches out there and my sister uh, who live in the cities. And then just I've been lucky because I've been able to get spare jobs when I needed it, some money. But I've, I've not really thought in terms of building a career. I just build a bunch of paintings that accumulate in a storage shed that, I have <laughs> that you visited uh, <laughs> our first uh, time together, Richard. And... Um, I don't know. I've just painted paintings and paint paintings and collected. I've got a, the most wonderful collection of Joe Miller paintings. <laughs> <laughs> and then I 
got some with my brother and some with my sister. And I've had families, fa Betsy's families and uh, John and other children. I've got children all over the place who have collected <laughs> my work. So I've got great collections of my work placed in places, but it hasn't even begun to handle my own personal collection of my work. J Joe, but you've got to clarify children all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you said it, Joe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I know of all the children that I've had. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all we need to know about that, right? <laughs> Nobody's here with the paternity thing, so. Uh, Sam, now you have left the island and moved yeah. to an urban center, and I'm assuming it's uh, for your education, but I'd also assume it's a career move. Is that kind of where you're headed, do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to say. I'm, I, I was really, I'm really happy to hear everyone else's kind of answers to this question, because I'm obviously a bit younger earlier in, in my career. The things you pointed out in terms of networking and, and, and opportunities are definitely real. But one of the things I, I think the most about is, I'm paraphrasing this, but it was something Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys said, where he talked about living somewhere where you feel very comfortable. And that in and of itself is conducive to creativity. And so a little bit like what Joe was saying, the thing for me is I want to make a lot of cool pictures. And with that, obviously growing up here, I know that a smaller community that doesn't really matter. I mean, if, if it's somewhere I feel inspired and, and comfortable living in the size of the audience is a little bit, you know, beside the point, I think. And so I think that's what I try to listen to, so to speak, is where I, where I know I've, I'll feel inspired or comfortable to, to work as an artist. And I just feel so lucky to grow up here and, and have a kind of understanding of what uh, that can be like if it's in a, a smaller place. And also just having people I can talk to, like I said, just listening to everyone else's answers to this question is going to be uh, um, remembered. Do you, oh, okay. I was going to say, do you see yourself coming? I mean, I know you're very young and there's a lot of years ahead, but do you see yourself at some point returning back to Salt Spring that, as an artist? It, I mean, this part of the world is so beautiful. It's kind of hard for me to say Salt Spring because it, it you know, that's like 18 years that I've been here or whatever growing up. But, you know, listening to people talk about this landscape, obviously I could imagine coming back to this part of the world one day because it, it's, it's so special. I tell everyone I'm, that I, all my friends out there, I'm sure lots of them could settle here. You know, someone that grew up in a big city, this is probably such a, such a dream come true. So I could see it happening, but no plans just wanted to um, ask you about social media and about mo modern technology and the ability to reach markets from your home wherever that is and perhaps you being younger it's easier for you than us old people who still wait to have a show somewhere or whatever so is is, is that the case is is can you survive as an artist through distance so it, it, Social media has a lot of pros and cons that I think uh, uh, people in a large way are kind of trying to navigate. There's a really great piece of writing by um, a woman named Jenny O'Dell. And I'll go into that a little bit before answering the question more specifically. It's just really important to remember that a lot of these things are designed to keep you like really addicted to them. And therefore you miss all the cool ways that they can help. That's a great piece. Uh, you know, look her up. She, it's been really good for me to to read and listen to her speak. Um, of the good things, our abilities, as you say, to reach markets, to put out. You know, I don't have a lot of experience with it, but putting out an ad, for example, for a show that I might have to put on myself, that can really draw some people in. It might not be you know people that can afford my pieces, whatever, but maybe they can afford a smaller print, they follow along and, and that kind of thing. And that can happen. I mean, it depends on the work, but as you can see, a lot of us make pictures 
And while, you know, it's great to be able to come and see work like this or John's work where you can really see the, the paint and the material, they're also really nice compositions. And that is one of the, to me, that's one of the joys of making images and making pictures is that it can, while it's not the same as getting to see it in person in the material, it does lend itself pretty nicely online. And, and people that aren't privileged enough to come and see it can still have like a, a nice experience with the works. So yes, it's possible. Uh, we're going back to the other topic. Glenn, we had a little conversation last night about living on the island as an artist. And do you feel that there's, um, especially when you're trying to think about the work that you're going to sell on the island, do you feel there's an element of compromise when you're thinking about the work that you're creating, thinking about the local market, as opposed if you were based in, say, New York or Chicago, and there would be perhaps a wider audience for different work that you may explore? Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like I'm really just... I'm still, I'm still navigating that. So I feel like for me, I went to school in Chicago. Um, it was incredibly active. I mean, you know, having graduated from art school, it was just like, there was just something, there were like 10 things happening every day, a hundred things happening every day. And it was overwhelming. And I, I wasn't really able to focus on making work as much as I am able to do that here. So I feel like for me, it's, I'm kind of, st I feel like I'm still in the exploratory stages of what that looks like on San Juan Island, because I feel like moving to San Juan 10 years ago, this has been a really fertile time for me as far as creating. And so I feel like I'm in a place right now where I have been m making a lot of work for the last 10 years or so, and it's varied, it's ceramics, it's painting, it's drawing and printmaking. And there are different markets for all of those things. You know, it's like pottery is a lot easier to sell in a market on San Juan Island than maybe fine art prints and paintings and things like that. But I do feel like I'm, I'm kind of in the, explore, the exploratory phases of that. I'm excited to learn more. And Danielle, do you feel the same thing about the idea of the opportunity for finding an, um, um, an audience for your work on San Juan Island? as opposed to an urban center? Uh, yes, so I, I had the experience of um, going through my, my undergrad and then at 22 moving directly to San Juan Island. And I was there for 13 years and of course you know, fell in love with the landscape and was a working artist um, and had several gallery exhibitions um, on the island and mostly West Coast um, and then I chose to get my MFA um, a few years ago so I, I I did feel like I needed to leave the community to get to the next level of my personal education where, where I wanted to um, I I wanted to understand where these these heroes of mine, these people that I had their art books, and I would, you know, we we discussed that we have an art book problem, you know, <laughs> living living on an island, you uh, that's where you get a lot of your artwork is. Yeah. Right. So I, I went to uh, Mass Art in Boston and studied with some of my heroes like Eduardo Morel, Barbara Bosworth, Laura McPhee. Um, if you know any of those photographers, they're, they're really wonderful and they were wonderful teachers um, so but when I was there I realized that I needed to that that my artistic home was still the Salish Sea so I was in Boston but working on images from here um, so that was that was I guess I feel like I'm digressing with that but um, but so I, I, I left to, to get a little bit more professional experience, but I ultimately decided to come back. And then I'm pre-pandemic, uh, I did quite a few residencies. And so for me, again, it was, I can be home doing my work, but then go out and connect with really amazing artists on, uh, through my, like, the cohort of the residencies. Jana, you have uh, enjoyed some success off Salt Spring Island. In fact, I think most people, are, a lot of people on Salt Spring haven't seen you work locally very often. Um, 
you have established a certain uh, market off the island, and there's probably could be the opportunity for to expand that market should you choose to move to, so Toronto or someplace like that. But you remain here. Has that ever presented a conflict for you? I don't think there's any conflict with it, um, uh, other than the fact that uh, things like uh, shipping shipping work off the island now is very expensive. Uh, shipping large pieces like the one I've got at Manon Hall there is a very expensive thing to do. Um, I remember a few years ago I um, sold a painting to a, a fellow down in um, uh, Los Angeles, and it was quite a large painting. And uh, so I built a crate for it, and it ended up being like um, eight or nine feet high and ten feet long. And then I decided to uh, boycott that and call a uh, um, framer down in Los Angeles. And uh, so we rolled it in a tube and sent it off. So that's always a bit of a problem. But um, uh, I think producing art, like for me when I was young, more than now, I was very eager to get a lot of galleries. I, needed, I thought, I've got to get a gallery. I've got to make money. Uh, so one time I had about 10 or 11 galleries all at one time. And uh, to be honest with you, I kind of burnt out on that. I, I just couldn't keep up producing that quantity of work and sending it off all over the place, coming up with new ideas. Uh, but I, I don't really, when I'm doing my work, I don't really look uh, locally, to be honest with you. I, um, I don't try to make things to sell now. Uh, at one time I did, but they were always, you know, five and a half feet high by, you know, six feet wide. Uh, anyhow, so that's what I was doing. So, um, uh, yeah, I, and I also, as Danielle is saying, I, I, I've always tried to uh, look to, to other places, to be honest, to to my my heroes, the people that I've always just uh, admired and love their work from art history or contemporary artists, you know, like Americans like Richard Diebenkorn or, you know, uh, as Gordon Smith said, his his references are 100 artists deep and mine are definitely uh, very much like that. So uh, I, I try to, again, it's kind of in your head thing because you can get very influenced by doing things. You can get very influenced by thinking, oh, I've got to do it and I've got to keep it in a certain price point because if it's a certain price point, it's going to sell. And it's like, uh, I don't know about that. Yeah. Well, that brings up a nice topic, um, and that is the idea of your process. When uh, an artist begins to work, there is obviously a host of questions that he or she may ask themselves. Um, why am I going to create this piece? Is it part of a larger body of work? Do I want to create this piece because I think it'll probably sell in a, in a juried show or an upcoming exhibition? How much do that is going to be part of my process? Um, some processes go on for a long period of time. Some, some pieces can take some weeks, months, years in some cases, and some work can be done in an afternoon or a weekend. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your process, perhaps if you want to be specific about the work you created for the shows that we're, we're just you know, showing at this point, and um, maybe a little bit about the time span and the thoughts that went into it. Um, who would like to start? Joe, do you want to start us off? I really don't, most instances, I don't have something that I'm imagining I'm going to paint. I first start making, I got a shape that I want to make and that I want to work on. And then I build the canvas and build, do the tacking and get it all put together and then uh, getting the surface ready for a painting. And I'm just not thinking about that at that point. I just know that eventually I'll get to the point where I've got to do something on that surface. And I'll think of something I want to do on that surface. And what I'm enthusiastic about. But I'm not thinking really about anything beyond what's going to happen right when I first start to paint, what am I? What am I going to do? Is it? I could just start with a knife and do something into it, or with a brush, or uh, it's very tactile at that point, and uh, it's just what I want to do. 
and then it starts to develop and I start to get go farther with it and understand a little bit more about what I'm doing and want to do. I'm just thinking about, uh, well, that's it. So there's no, <laughs> no preliminary sketches or studies that you're working from? You're just really allowing yourself? Not usually. Uh, I, <clears throat> I had an early period in which I did many, many drawings. At night, I would just draw these ink drawings, and I've got a big stack of those that are about this big. But I've sort of, I really didn't do that to think about what I was going to paint. I did that because I wanted to do those drawings. And then I did a lot of work on paper. I've got a lot of folders full of uh, watercolor paintings on uh, usually uh, mulberry paper. And uh, I've just got those coming out of my ears. And, um, but I've left that behind in a way. Now I just make these stretchers and love the knife and the brushes and the paint. I love oil paint and the transparencies and the, the thick stuff. And uh, I want, that's what I'm enthusiastic about. I will say, and as an aside, that you're only looking at the front of Joe's paintings, but I've seen the back of his paintings, and they are the most beautiful stretchers. <laughs> they really are. They're beautifully built. And the fact that he uses tacks rather than staples on his Belgian linen um, and rabbit skin glue, for those of you who care, and I really care, <laughs> that is a beautiful substrate. Um, just, and I, I, and I, I would almost say a lost art in some ways. So I just, I really... It's such a pleasure to see you taking such pride in every element of your painting. I just wanted to point that out. It really was an honor to see that, and I'm very grateful that you share that. Anna, your piece that's in the hall presently must have taken an enormous amount of time to plan the logistics involved, um, the ideas. Could you talk us through the process a little bit? So, um, yeah, the... The pieces in the hall has been years, but it's also really immediate, I would say. So I am still living in that world, and it's, I, you know, I don't, I truly, truly, truly would never have um, planned to go down that pathway. I mean, honestly, it's, but I, I think my work really stems from questions that I have. And it's this is the way that my hands and my eyes and my brain help me answer the questions. So the question that I, was, I have been working on is, like the really big question is, how did we get here? How did we get to this place where we are concerned about the future? I mean, I remember being concerned about nuclear war. Somehow that's not so concerning now. I don't, it's, it could happen, it could not happen, but that's something over there. But what we're doing is we're all not making decisions, thinking about consequences. So that's sort of the, the world I'm, I'm sort of inhabiting. And so I read, and I, um, I allow hints to come to me, like I was in a used bookstore and there was a book called Salt, and I thought, like, how can somebody write a book about salt? <laughs> like, what is there to say? And it is amazing. I mean, Mark Kurlansky, salt, dive in. It's the, the you know, then, you, it's had such an effect on all our history. So all of the bits and pieces that come together of how we have been on this planet and all of the other beings that we share with. Like I remember um, being a kid and seeing two documentary films at school. One was The Mighty Salmon and so the salmon swims in and out of my work over the years. It keeps coming back and saying, we figured out how to live here. 
And I follow that. And, and every time I dive into the salmon, I learn something else. The other film that affected me was, and I don't even remember, sort of probably it was The Miracle of Plastic. So I remember the first plastic bottle that I held, and it was a bottle of shampoo, and I thought it was a miracle because I could have a bath and wash my hair and not worry about the glass breaking, which was like a real fear. So, and but then I started feeling this material and really being put off by it. It was this greasy entity that didn't feel like it should belong here. So, and then Ingrid Bergman, in an interview, said that she thought that plastic was a miracle because you could make stuff and it would never break. Well, we have since learned that the miracle is that we are, we need another miracle that gets us back to understanding how to live here without that. So I just follow these little threads. I have skills um, that I have built up over decades. I remember being a kid and, and saying to my immigrant parents, no, I'm not going to be a doctor. I went and studied that. I was nine years old. I had been going to the library and reading about the history of medicine because I was the good daughter. And then, but I woke up. And I just thought, no, that's not what I'm here for. I'm going to be an artist and talk about a freak out. So, um, and, you know, they kept saying, well, maybe you could just be like a medical technician. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm going, no, I'm, I'm going to be an artist and I will figure it out. And so I just thought I have to be able to make whatever comes into my head. This is like, who was this child? So I went through sewing and knitting and spinning and weaving and working with wood and working with metal. And I wanted to learn how to repair cars because I thought that would be important. But I never did learn that. And so I just follow, I feel like Hansel and Gretel trying to find my way home and following all of the little crumbs that are placed in front of me and say, hey, what do you think about that? And I go, I don't know, but let's see where it goes, where it takes me. So, yeah, I don't think that's a very good answer, but it's what it is. <laughs> On the contrary, it's an excellent answer. Sam, when I first saw your work, it was a lovely selection of, I, I guess, maybe environmental portraiture would be one way of describing some of your earlier work. Mm -hmm. And then we saw later work that was quite a departure and even your more contemporary work it seems like a departure from even that. Yeah. So I've seen an, a, a tremendous <clears throat> scope of your approach in the last little while. Can you talk about maybe the commonalities to your process that still exist, or perhaps your process has been changed? Yeah, I try to stay open to change and open um, the way you described it at first. That I mean, time's an interesting concept for a photographer because, Danielle, we use it... Uh, it's like a technical thing for us. Um, but I, I think being a student and getting shown all these, you know, different kind of processes that you can do, it made me want to stay open to all of them. So one of the earlier projects of mine called Playtime, I'm a little bit more like a painter. I'm in the studio setting things up to be photographed. The final thing is a photograph. But I can go days without hitting the shutter just because things aren't right. It's not, it's not quite there yet. And at the same time, a project like the Water and Light, which is at Man Hall, where it's a point and shoot one one hundredth of a second is, where, is when it happens. So all my work stems from, I think of it a bit like having time where I'm quite free form not many rules at all, but something sticks out eventually. And it always does. And kind of like how Anna was saying, you just try things and maybe it doesn't go the way you want it to, the way you think it might, but you try it anyways. And then you have something you can see and you can make decisions about which way to go, whether it's thematic or, or process-based. A lot of my work is process-based. 
And can, can you clarify process based? Yeah, I, I guess it means lots of different things to different people. To me, it's that when I'm talking and thinking about my work, I'm not necessarily, oh, that thing in the picture means this. And and that's one of the reasons was I didn't want to come to something like this and say, oh, yeah, that thing means that. And if you have a different interpretation, you know, you're wrong about that. That's really not how I wanted to do it. And just naturally my, my brain went to thinking about, well, what did I do? How, how did this picture come to exist and what kind of concepts are within that uh, process that um, resonate with me kind of. Um, and so specifically with this, yeah, with this work, it happens so quickly and a lot of it, I mean, in hindsight, I'm just very thankful that I didn't have this urge to know it has to take so much time and this and that because it just doesn't. Sometimes it's a very simple gesture and I, uh, that produces something that it's something that sparks my intuition and it's kind of hard to put into words. But when when the arrow points that way, I know I need to follow it. And it's very rare that I have a great artist statement at that point, or I can talk about it a lot at that point. But then it's about just making and looking, a lot of times looking and, and thinking what, what kind of ideas come to me, what kind of, like I said, concepts resonate with me, and often trying to explain exactly what it is. Because with a, a series like that and some of my other work as a photographer, the question of, okay, what, what actually is this? gets asked all the time and I like to have an answer for that. Does, that. does that bother you? I mean, your earlier work that I saw was far more of a clear narrative and I think people would be able to recognize that your work now is a little more conceptual. Is it more of a challenge to? When I first started, I was like, oh, it doesn't matter. Like, just look at it and, and, and that. And I still feel that way generally. What I got used to was kind of a logistical thing that if somebody doesn't want to know if they have this nice experience with the work and maybe they don't know, but they can connect to it. They don't have to read about it. And, and that's totally fine, fine with me. So it took, there was definitely like some angsty years where I was like, I'm not writing an artist statement, you know, but, uh, I just, I think I went to someone's show and I didn't know what it was that they photographed. And I asked them and they were like, no. <laughs> I was like, okay, I don't, uh, if somebody, cause curiosity is such a big part of probably what we all do that it felt kind of rude to not at least have an option or to at least have like something where someone could become curious and, and, and follow their own thread about what they like about the work. So that, that was a big moment, I guess you could say. I think we could have a whole evening discussing artist statements and how yeah. much we love or hate, hate yeah. them. But Glenn, your process as a printmaker is very specific. And I think I was it was lovely to see your, your woodplot prints. Maybe you could at least talk us a little bit through the process that you do to create them. Yeah. So it they're really I feel like they're they're woodblock prints, but they're different from what a lot of people think of as woodblock prints because most people or most woodblock printers have a concept, carve an image, and then repeatedly print that image or make developments from that image. And with this series, I think I like, I really enjoy printmaking as this kind of way of discovering an image. And I think it's, it's more like a response to the process and a building of the image, but what's basically happening is that I'm printing layers of color and blocking out areas with stencils, with cut paper stencils. And I'm doing, I'm, I have a registration system, so I'm able to continuously print on the same spot every single time um, and build the image up that way. So some of the prints, I'm like looking at the one print that's on top there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. More on the back. <laughs> There's more. Um, a couple of the prints do have some carved marks on the wood block, but even those prints have um, components of stenciling and overprinting and ghost printing. So they're really, I feel like they're actually really more mono prints in a way. And I really... When I was when I was writing my artist statement for this show, <laughs> speaking of, um, I really was. It was really nice to think about my process actually um, during that writing process because 
it made me realize how important that that sort of technical process based art form is to me because it's almost it kind of is like this portal into the art making process and it's like I feel like you show up at the studio and you've got you have to get out your ink and you have to open all the really sticky ink charts and you have to mix your ink and you have to like mix all the things into your ink because it's stiff and like all the things and you like it's like you're laying out this this area and the space and all the time that you're doing that you're kind of like percolating and you're just kind of incubating and you're not really thinking like okay as soon as i get this ink mixed up i'm gonna make a mountain <laughs> like you're kind of like okay the first step is i just have to get the ink out of the jars <laughs> okay then i have to do this and you know that you're gonna be there for a while because it's kind of like this thing and so it's like you're kind of like it's like this kind of like long entry point which is kind of like a soft entry a little bit for me because you don't have to show up with your idea right away. It's like you can kind of like ease into it. And then for a lot of these pieces, I just really just started with a color. It's like I just inked the whole block and I just started with a color and then and then you're in love with it and you're just like, oh, and you like peel the like thin paper off of the print and the ink is like sitting on top of the thin paper and you're, it's just like really tactile and you're like, oh my God, I love this blue square. <laughs> <laughs> this is so great. And so by that point you're in it and that you can't go back and you don't want to go back. And it's like, you know, maybe you were kind of like, oh my God, this is going to take five hours. Oh, I'm going to get hungry. I'm going to get, you know, whatever. And then you're like, I don't care. I'm going to stay here all day. And just like, and so, yeah, I think for me, it's just, I love process based things like that. And because it's kind of a time commitment too, I think it helps me, um, it helps me commit to these like larger chunks of time and make like, work in kind of more concentrated bursts of activity, which I think is helpful as well. And, and just kind of generate more volume, which I really enjoy too. Um, because then you can kind of lay it all out and you can add, it's like, once you have your like beginnings, it's like you can edit and you can add and it's just a, it's a nice flow for me. So I appreciate um, the opportunity to really think about that. <laughs> so thank you. I think any printmakers in the audience right now are getting really anxious that they're not in their studio <laughs> because, <laughs> because it does sound really, really good. <laughs> Danielle, uh, your process involves a wetsuit. Maybe you can give us a little bit more background on that. Yeah, this is sometimes. Um, I, I feel like I'm... Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I started out with a camera pretty young and also painting pretty young. So it, everything kind of developed parallel. Um, I, I feel like if I was more brave, I'd be a painter. So I, you know, I would confront the blank canvas and, and, you know, be able to move from that spot. But as, as it is, what I do is I, I like going into the environment. Um, and to me, walking moving through space is very uh, meditative and of course i want to be in nature um so taking a a picture and i work with a wide variety of cameras um but taking a picture is just capturing a moment but when when i would get it back as just a, a darkroom print or a digital print it never had the feeling of the landscape of what I experience, all the senses coming in. And that's when I started to really try to, to try to layer, um, layer in the painting and the, the mixed media. Um, and then breaking away to different materials, like bringing in the steel that was submerged in the salt water. And um, that, that idea actually came about when I was away in Boston in grad school. And all I could think about being in the city was like, oh, what would it feel like to be in this, be in this environment? So I'd prep everything and then I'd fly home for break and I'd immerse everything and then pull it out and bring it up and display it. And so in a way it was this um, like kind of substitute for my body being in, in the environment. 
So that that's kind of a, a start of the process. And then it, you know, then there's the whole studio time, which is, um, you know, that, that, that's a whole nother thing. And whenever I do get, it, it's rare these days, especially being a new mom and also quite a few of us work. And, and then, so when you do get these little chunks in the studio, it's really, um, you know, for me, that's, that's my favorite part is, is what can happen and evolve when you're in that, that space. That's another conversation yeah. that for artists that who also have to have day jobs, the time away from your studio is, can be like a time away from family or a time away from a, a nurturing experience. And it's hard to be away. And I appreciate what, what that's like. John, you and I have talked a lot about your process and, uh, and I find it fascinating and inspiring. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about just how time comes into it. it, it it's res how you're allowing the time of your process to be a, a big part of it. <clears throat> well, I know um, when I'm working on, on pieces quite often, they take me uh, uh, you know, a number of years to paint. Uh, I've probably worked on paintings for five, five years. And, and at one time I had 100 paintings on the go in my studio all at one time. And my wife came to me and said, you got to finish some of these things off. <laughs> and, uh, but... Um, I, I think uh, when you're working in your space, and I'm, I'm there all the time working, you're very isolated, uh, and um, time can play kind of funny tricks on you. You know, you've, you're working on something, you put it away for a while because you're letting it dry. You work on something else, you bring it up. Um, I find a lot of times it is negotiating with the kind of the abstract things that uh, time can place on your mind a little bit. And uh, I don't know if you've ever experienced that just by immersing yourself in things but uh, I usually work in um, you know many layers how I start is very random um, a couple of paintings in the in the show over here uh, start I worked on some pieces of old plywood that I found at the dump when I was taking my garbage there I looked over and I saw these painting these uh, camp or um, wooden structures, glue marks all over them. And I thought that's a great starting point right there. I really love how it looks there. Um, a, a couple of the paintings in the show here are on the backs of other canvases. I uh, had them lying on the floor and I saw all these stain marks coming through. These were acrylic paintings, by the way, so they're, in, they're archivally okay. Uh, and then I thought, well, I'll use that as a starting point to, to work on something and maybe I'll be able to let a little bit of that breathe through. Um, I usually don't have a plan, but I will have started with an idea of some kind. Uh, one of the pieces, the deer piece in the, in the show over here, started from uh, an observation I had of uh, just observing deer. I was looking out one day and there were two deer looking straight at me. One was slightly behind the other. The other one moved off. The other one moved off at exactly the same time and moved off in just like a Michael Jackson dance sequence. But they were in perfect, uh, you know, time. They're perfectly timed, and I was wondering how that happened. And and uh, then I was thinking also about um, people being like that too. Someone does something, someone else kind of follows along and does the same thing. Then I was thinking about the painting. Can't remember who would paint it. Maybe Peter Bruegel painted it, blind leading the blind. Uh, so I decided to do a painting uh, with deer with numbers in their ears, uh, tracking. They're tracking, they're being tracked, like we're all being tracked, we're all being filmed right now. We're all being, you know, you go on your device and your device is sitting on the table there and uh, you think it's off and it's listening to you. So, uh, <laughs> um, so and then my, the one with the car in, in the other place over there, I go on road trips with my daughter and um, we were going through the interior a couple of years ago and when all the fires were going on, and it was recommended not to go, really. Uh, but my daughter really wanted to go, so I said, okay, we'll go. So we go, and we couldn't go up through the canyon, so we went up another route. We witnessed a car accident. Uh, this truck flipped over. A guy was getting out of his truck, and he was totally disoriented, and then his car blew up into flames. We pulled over on the side of the road, and uh, uh, we were going to change up who was going to be driving. We both passed, passed out in the car. Uh, so that was the starting point for that particular piece. Uh, and just how it's all made, uh, the materials I use, I'm really open. I try to be really open to the different materials, how I'm processing things together. Um, you know, some things work, some things don't work. 
some things I've seen before and I'm stealing from other people. Other things are, are maybe a little new, for, at least for myself. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's it, I guess. It's a wonderful opportunity to realize for all of us here that um, so much of what is in your work we never see. I rather, so much as what is in the work that we cannot see, the experiences that you've had that are so varied and very different from where you finally came to with the work. We can look at the work and, and we make our own conclusions, and I'm sure a lot of you are content to allow us to make our own conclusions, but it is a real honor to hear this enormous backstory for, for where you got to. I'm only curious, one last thing, John, when a painting's on the, in your studio for, for a number of years, how do you know when it's done? I go through the same thing over and over again. Uh, in the evening, I'll finish something off and I'll, I'll look at it and go, boy, John, you've really outdone yourself this time. For me, that's, I really like what's going on there. And uh, then always I come in in the morning and I go, what a, what a piece of shit that is. It's, <laughs> it's terrible. And then I, I just I, I keep working on them over and over again. This body of work is interesting because at a certain point, I felt like they were at least a couple of the pieces were get, getting kind of overworked. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm just going to keep going at it. I'm going to keep working on it. So I worked on it more and more and more and more and more and, and pulled out different aspects on it. So it was like a rabbit hole. I went down consciously and uh, uh, I think I made them work. But, uh, you know, at different times they could be, they could be f finished. What I feel like is, though, when I come back to them, uh, say if I leave it at night, I look at it, and I come in the morning. If it looks the same, then I'll say it could be finished. It, but most of the time, it looks different. When it stands still, when time stands still, then it's then it for me it's done. But not totally still. There's got to be something in it, yeah, uh, a, a hook or a, a leverage there somehow that keeps the flow inwards, outwards, across the, the space, and within myself when I'm looking at it that. Uh, uh, gives it to me. I think we yeah. could have a support group for the anxiety around whether or not a piece is completed or not, <laughs> because there is that ongoing question, isn't there? Yeah. Richard. Um, well, now I'm going to see if anyone wants to ask any of the artists or collectively or individually any questions. Um, so if you want to raise your hand, if you have a question, if not, we have lots of questions ourselves. So if anyone has anything in particular they want to ask... Uh, Bruce. Just follow on what uh, John said and what Joe said earlier to antithetical. Well, I mean, your starting Bruce is very intuitive, very casual, uh, instinctive. And just hearing John talk about concluding the picture, uh, I remember one of my teachers said, You paint yourself out of the picture. Mm. Mm. Uh, so I just maybe hear I uh, have the same question to, to Joe. When you call something done, when do you know it's done? So the question is for Joe, when do you know when a work is complete? When is it finished? It's finished when I don't paint on it anymore. <laughs> Succinct, yes, great. Yep, I appreciate that. Uh, anyone else? Barbara. Good question, but there's no figure of work here. Good. Uh, and I don't see the human condition. There are people living in the Pacific Northwest. What is happening? Could this same or similar exhibition uh, have maybe occurred 30 years ago? Maybe, maybe not. This feels very much environment, sense of place, uh, a bit of hum. Mm. Did you all hear that? Are you happy with that? Okay. Um, so anyone in particular, Barbara, want to quite answer no. that? Or just, any, so anyone feel, react to that, want to react? Joe? Uh, yeah, uh, probably some people here haven't been over to the other gallery. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. John at the end here, I think. Is that your name? I think so. Yeah, okay. Uh, I was I was stunned when I saw these works there. They're huge. They're really gigantic. 
And uh, I didn't know what I was looking at for a while. I spent time looking at them and it started to come to me. Oh, it was a little bit like living in a forest like I do. One of the paintings is like, oh, there are deer, two deer there. Mm -hmm. Uh, it took a while for these things to emerge. And then one of the most challenging paintings for me was this accident or whatever we're talking about in, in this painting. And uh, it, it's a miracle, this work. It's got a, my brother and my sister have to go over there and see it. And then there's her work that's over there. It's, yeah, some of the people here haven't seen that work over there. And it's important to go over there. Why, when, when you can. Does anyone else want to come into the Anna? So, um, yeah, John, John's work does have figures in it, and also uh, Jane Kidd has created figures with her tapestry. So I'm, but I'm just thinking about what you were saying about how are we expressing our our environment with and our being in this environment, and. It's not straightforward, definitely not straightforward, but we all, because we live here, we are affected. And um, I think that Danielle is expressing her connection with, with the, the whole sea, the Salish Sea, and, and our interaction with it. And also um, Glenn, she is expressing how she is living in the, she's, I see her figures, even though they're not figurative, I see walking through the landscape. So maybe next time you'll get more figurative painters. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think also, the, John, one sec. Um, I, I do think the human condition is represented in, in, in many different ways. And in Reve's painting as well, the, 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 it's, maybe it's not humans, but, but there's an awful lot. And I know a little bit of backstory. And, and um, that is life. <laughs> Very much that. Hu human, human life. And, it's, and everything is. But, but you're absolutely right about the things. John. Like I, I, I personally feel like uh, the when you look at at work, whether there's figures in it or not, I mean the, the and all work has the ghost, the human presence in it. It's uh, it's um, uh, all the work we see ha has that. You you know the touch of uh, you know uh, uh, something that's been made will have the dimensions of someone's hand. You'll probably you know figure out how wide something is by the touch of it or the feel of it or the weight of it. And um, I, I, it, with my own work, I was trying to, at a certain point, I discovered that I was trying to create almost phantasms. Like these are worlds or a world halfway between reality uh, and fantasy, half between, halfway between being alive and being dead. Um, like I used the, the eagle in the piece and it, it was alive at one time 50 years ago or 70 years ago, but it's definitely dead. But uh, uh yeah, that's all I had to say. Sam? Yeah, I would encourage everyone to go to the Man Hall uh, show because while there's not a lot of like people in it, I think like especially Anna's work directly looks at some really deep anxieties that we all have about the world we live in and especially the problems that we humans create in, in that world. So, Okay, thanks. Daniel? Just one thing with Barbara's comment is um, I, I immediately go to how much we're saturated with imagery and media and, it's, I mean, TV, phones, Internet, you know, people. We've, we've chosen to reduce the amount of, of what we see by isolating ourselves to islands and the amount of people we interact with versus living in Manhattan. And then if... I know like for, for my work, even reducing it further, I mean, I talk a lot about just that really simple above below horizon. Um, it, again, I eliminate the people where I'm trying to get to like a, a core of something that is, is that I can't really speak to, but it, if I'm, I'm sitting here right now looking at like Tom's sculptures and Glenn's mountains and it, to me, it is getting, 
we live in such a loud world. And so I, it really resonates with me having, um, our, our earth basically like where we live, our home reduced to these really simple forms. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, at the back. So this one's for the photographers, uh, Danielle and Sam. We had that wonderful summation of how you know your painting's done when you stop painting on it. Um, so with you guys, like you touched on, you sort of capture, it's sort of about capturing images in time and you're often taking a bunch of uh, photographs of a particular subject. So how do you figure out which frame is the right one to use, which one is worth uh, like hanging up in the gallery and uh, is the final, how do you know your final product? So I'm sorry, are you asking, which, like, are you talking about like editing? So, so I, I guess that's where I'm going with it. With photography, you can take millions of digital photos very quickly and um, let's see. So often I go back to film. Um, I still shoot with film cameras and actually I go even prim more primitive where I shoot a lot with um, cameras that are way, that are older than me, you know, they're, you know, antique box cameras. And um, I'll even go as primitive as pinhole photography. And in a way that slows the process way, way down. I also do shoot digital and, uh, in this show, there's both digital and analog, but to me, um, working with film reduces that, and um, I can, I can get closer to the like sl slows me down enough to think about what I'm photographing. Can you just quickly tell us what pinhole photography is? <clears throat> oh, um, yes, it, it's. It goes back to like camera obscura, but ba basically you can, I, I have some cameras I've made out of a, a box, a simple cardboard box where you paint it black, you put it, take a little piece of tin foil, you put one pinhole in it, and then it, it just the simple act of the light and then a light sensitive medium, um, it gathers the light and projects it onto your surface. And it, so it's the most simple form of photography gathering light. Thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so like Danielle, using analog and and I think especially like printing from an analog image that you make on film, it really slows things down. And you can, I mean, in a simple way, you just start kind of pre planning what kind of pictures you want to print out because you have to there's certain technical things you might want to aim for or have to do when you're taking the picture um to make like a nice print so it really it slows things down I, things generally come down to an intuitive thing for me where something clearly oh i want to see that bigger or i need to see how it because it's an intro like it's an interesting thing. You can make images, but then when you print it and put it in the space that can shift your decision making a lot. So, I mean, I, I usually would like to print something and look at it with other things and see how they relate to each other. I also generally work in like full bodies of work. So that kind of helps me a lot because something might be look very nice. But when I see it with the rest of the images, I'm not actually that into it. And so it's a lot of kind of making demo type pieces, I would say for me. And then, ev but eventually there's a very clear moment of, uh, okay, this is, this is done. It's, it's not like additive the way I'm like, you know, painters can technically add more, but it's, sorry, it's a bit of a tricky question to answer for, for a photographer. Excellent. Daniel. Sorry, if I can add one more thing. Um, and so sometimes I get to go out and teach and teaching the generation that's like, you know, in their early 20s, so many of them have only seen their artwork or photography on screens. And in that digital kind of scrolling format, 
And so it's, it's amazing when you can um, export it into some way, like print it out, even if it's just a really, really cheap print and get it up on a wall. And that step will, will slow you down and, and, and really make you see photography in a, in a different light. Great, thank you for that. Okay, I have some bad news in that that's more or less it. But some good news is that there's another one in uh, at two o'clock in, in Man Hall. And, and um, these six fine artists and wonderful people won't be there. Well, you're welcome to come, but you won't be talking. Well, you might be talking. <laughs> you probably can't, can't stop you. just don't want me there. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 John, we always want you there. But, um, so please do come if you get the chance. Have some lunch and then, then head over to the hall. Um, that is two o'clock, two o'clock, and Patrick and I are going to be busy as soon as you leave. We have to reset this into the exhibition, and from 2.30 till 6, this will be open fully as in exhibition mode, so you can see it without everybody else in here. Um, well, I've really enjoyed this, and I think we could actually sit here for another four hours, but, but um, maybe we can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. On, on behalf of ArtSpring and the SaltSpring Arts and everybody in this room, thank you hugely. And we all thank you because without you, we aren't here. So thank you all very much and see you later. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Patrick.